A bride contacted the Dear Prudence advice column of Slate Magazine to seek guidance on how to best handle a unique situation she had recently experienced. The bride wrote, My husband and I have done really well for ourselves and finally reached a point where we could afford a huge blowout wedding to celebrate our lives together with everyone we know and love. My husband's best friend, I, wear them, I lost my spot. Everyone, you know, my husband's best friend, Matthew, was the best man for the wedding. The setting was beautiful. Everyone seemed happy. Our families were overjoyed, she writes. My mom may have even used the phrase hallelujah a few dozen times. <laughs> the entire atmosphere felt moving at our wedding. So moving, in fact, that Matthew stopped mid-ceremony. Matthew's the best man. Matthew stopped mid-ceremony to propose to his longtime girlfriend, Ashley, and reveal her pregnancy. The bride writes, I couldn't even hear the vows my husband wrote or the rest of the ceremony over the noise of Ashley's happy sobs, her very surprised family who were also guests, and people seated nearby congratulating her. Even the videographer cut to her frequently during the ceremony. You can't hear anything over the chatter. When Matthew gave his toast at the reception, he apologized for being caught up in the moment and then proceeded to talk about Ashley's funiture and him with nary a mention of us. During the reception, Matthew and Ashley became the primary focus of our guests. Matthew even went out of his way to ask the band for a special dance for just him and Ashley on the dance floor. The bride writes, I've never been an attention hog. I wouldn't even have minded if he proposed after the ceremony. But weeks later, I'm still seething, she writes. I am so shocked and angry that I keep asking myself if this is real life. My husband hasn't spoken to Matthew since the wedding. And our mutual friends think what he did was rude, but that my husband should just get over it. My husband has joked that he'll resume his friendship when Matthew and Ashley give him a $40,000 check for their half of the wedding. Jealousy has a powerful effect on some people. In this case, Matthew was so caught up with his best friend getting married, he just couldn't take it. He wanted and had to use that platform of his friend's wedding to use for his own proposal to his girlfriend. And if we're honest, most of us struggle with jealousy. Of course, not to the point where we might do something like Matthew does. But most of us struggle with jealousy from time to time with different situations. And what is jealousy? Jealousy is that envious feeling that we have of someone else's possessions, achievements, or their advantages. It might be someone's nice house they have, their well-behaved children, a great job, their education that they received, the family of you know, brothers and sisters and extended family, some vacations they get to go on, or things that we might feel jealous when other people have those. And if we're not careful, that jealousy can steal our joy and lead us to do harmful things to ourselves and to others. Of course, we wouldn't do what Matthew did to just steal the, the whole wedding for your own benefit. Most of us have more self-control than that. But jealousy can cause subtle problems in our lives. But it can also be good, too, in certain situations. Jealousy can be a good thing. When you're with someone and you let that other person pray and you hear her pray and you hear this relationship she has with God, you might say, man, I want a relationship with God like she has. Or if you're talking with someone about the Bible and asking questions and they can kind of quote scripture and explain what the Bible says in different spots, it's okay to be jealous. Like, I think I would love to know scripture like that person does. Some parts of jealousy can be good and encourage good, helpful habits and decisions. But most of the time, jealousy bubbles up in our lives around worldly things. And those are the things we need to be aware of. Usually they focus on us and what we have or others have and how we want what they have. 
And as we read this passage today, we read about jealousy in one of John the Baptist's disciples that he has regarding the size of John the Baptist's crowd that is getting smaller and the size of Jesus's crowd that is getting larger. So we read about that disciple's jealousy, but then we read about John the Baptist's response, his godly mature response to these things occurring. So in our time together, we'll look at the jealous talk from that disciple in the first uh, four or five verses there, and then we'll look at the John talk, where John describes him as the friend of the groom, using a metaphor to describe it there. So let's look at this jealous talk that's shared, starting in verses 22 to 26. It says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with the Jew about purification. And they came to John, and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So this jealous talk that this disciple shares with John the Baptist stems around three reasons that they're jealous about how Jesus' crowd is getting larger while John the Baptist's crowd is getting smaller. One is the location that we read about in verse 22. It says, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. Prior to this, Jesus was in Jerusalem. He's at the temple where he, he cleans out the temple. He starts doing uh, miraculous signs and scripture tells us that Jesus is getting more and more people that are following him there in the temple in Jerusalem and Jerusalem is the city where the temple is and Judea describes kind of the country the region as a broader area and so Jesus exits the city and enters Judea the countryside that it discusses here and this is important because when we learn about John the Baptist John the Baptist was in the big city doing ministry right no, he was in the outskirts and kind of in the desert area. So when Jesus leaves Jerusalem, the city, to go out to the desert, he's now starting to encroach on John the Baptist's quote-unquote territory, you might say. You know, and so that's one of the reasons this disciple is a little um, jealous is because Jesus' crowd is now starting to take over John the Baptist crowd because Jesus is encroaching on their territory that they see here. So that's the first cause of this jealous talk was the location of Jesus. The second cause was the amount of people there. At the end of verse 22 it says, and there he was spending time with them and was baptizing. That's describing Jesus as he enters the countryside. He was spending time with them and baptism and baptizing them. And the use there is described what's called an iterative imperfect, which describes an action that's being done over and over and over again, often by multiple people. So Jesus is there baptizing, and we know from John chapter 4 that it wasn't just Jesus that was baptizing. John chapter 4 verse 2 says his disciples were baptizing these people. Probably because there were so many coming to him, he couldn't baptize them all on his own. Just like in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Peter gives this sermon, and then it says that 3,000 people got baptized in one day as a result of Peter's sermon. So Peter probably didn't baptize 3,000 people. There probably was a group of people baptizing on his behalf, just like Jesus was probably doing here. So Jesus is kind of encroaching on John the Baptist territory. He's got these big crowds of people coming there. And the third reason for this jealous talk is the relationship that John the Baptist's followers probably had with John the Baptist. They loved John the Baptist. They believed in his ministry. They knew he was getting people to repent and turn toward the Savior. And it says in verse 26 that this disciple or these groups of disciples come to John and say, Jesus is baptizing, and all are coming to him. This was hard for John's disciples to accept. The message, which is a loose paraphrase of the Bible, puts it this way. 
It says Jesus is competing with us. He's baptizing too. And everyone is going to him instead of us. These disciples were wondering, how could the pupil, Jesus, be better than the master, John the Baptist? Because Jesus didn't Jesus come to John the Baptist to get baptized? How could the one that got baptized become greater than the baptizer? The third reason for their jealousy of Jesus. So thus far, as, as John describes this scene for us, we see this jealous talk of the disciples of John the Baptist that they're sharing and up until this point of time, we've seen John the Baptist and his great work getting people ready for the Messiah. But starting in verse 27, we see John the Baptist's great character as he sees himself and his role in Jesus' plan on the earth. And there's a metaphor here that describes this relationship, the John talk. There's a metaphor. He uses a wedding ceremony to make his point. And a metaphor is something that compares two things without using the words like or as. That's what a metaphor is. It compares two things in order to illuminate one thing. And the metaphor that he uses here is a wedding ceremony. And in a Jewish wedding, there would be obviously a bride and a groom, and then a, the groom would have a friend or a best man, just kind of like our weddings today. But unlike our weddings today, the groom's friend had a primary job to do in the wedding ceremony. And weddings today in American culture, we tell the groom and the guys show up on time and say yes is about all we expect them to do, right? The women kind of plan everything, the bride and the bridesmaids. But in a Jewish wedding, the friend of the groom had various jobs to do. He was an assistant to the groom. He would make preliminary arrangements for the wedding ceremony to get everything ready. He would help the groom prepare his home for when the bride would arrive there. He helped direct the wedding feast that occurred for seven days after the engagement period. And as a friend of the groom, that friend of the groom, his joy came when the groom got married to the bride. He was happy and joyful on behalf of the groom and what the groom was experiencing, not because of his own personal benefit or blessings. And the groom is described for us in verses 31 and third through 36, which we'll look at first. I know that's at the end of the passage, but it describes the groom for us which is Jesus and what he's done. Now, some Bible translations say this whole passage from verse 27 to 36 is John the Baptist, and others will divide it up and say, starting with verse 31, this is actually John the Gospel writer. So the NIV takes that this is John the Gospel writer. There's no quotation marks. Some Bibles will keep the quotation marks throughout. And that's because in Greek, there's no quotation marks. So the translators have to kind of look for markers that might indicate when the speech starts and ends, and this is one place where they don't always agree. But regardless of this is John the Baptist or John the Disciple, I'll just say it's John for going forward. Are we good with that? And either way, it'll be right. It's John talking to us, and he wants us to learn that we need to place our faith in Christ for salvation by saying in verse 31, he who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is from the earth, and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Verse 36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John uses what he describes here as a seal to picture for us, what it means to place our trust in Christ for salvation. And verse 33, he who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. 
And the seal was used in Bible times because most people could not read. So they would design a seal or a signet ring that you could stamp on things. And that was a way to show who things belonged to, but also a way to authenticate who they were, um, authenticate that something was from someone by putting that seal or image on things. And the meaning here is that those who accept Christ are not only entering into a relationship with him, but they're accepting that what he said he, who he says he was, was that he was God in the flesh, that he came from heaven, and that he came to remove sins of people, and that that message was true. So by placing our faith in Christ, we receive eternal life that he describes, but also by setting our seal on Jesus, it removes God's wrath. When it says in verse 33, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Notice how the wrath of God is on all people. It's not as if we're, we're born and we do a certain amount of bad things and then God's wrath comes to us or there's a level of good things we have to get to and then God's wrath is removed. God's wrath is placed on all people because when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden in Genesis, his disobedience and his sin nature was passed on to every single human being. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and through death sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. God's wrath is on us all because we are all sinful and disobedient, and we need help. And that help comes to us through Jesus Christ. For he who believes in the Son has eternal life. So that's who this amazing groom is, that he came to offer us salvation for everyone that places our faith in them. And John starts out here in verse 27 by thanking the groom for what he has done and who he is. Verse 27 says, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. John the Baptist's first words are words of gratitude. He's had a good run. He's had years of fruitful ministry. And he reminds this disciple that everything he's been given has been a gift from God. He's received more than he probably ever expected to do in life. And if it's his time to step aside and let the groom have center stage, he's okay with that. It reminds me of uh, Tom Selleck in the show Blue Bloods, if you've seen Blue Bloods, that's on CBS. Tom Selleck plays Frank Reagan, who is the chief of police for the New York uh, Police Department. And he's a very morally upright character, and he's always clashing with the mayor. The mayor wants to do what's popular and what everyone will like. Frank, Tom Selleck, always wants to do what's going to protect the people and support his cops. And usually that ends up the mayor threatening Tom Selleck with his job. If you don't do what I say, you know, I'm going to fire you. And Tom Selleck, throughout every season, he always has the same reply with that goatee that he always has. He'll rub his goatee and he'll say, I serve at your pleasure, Mayor. And it's his way of saying, you can fire me if you want. I'll step aside. I've had a good run. I've done my job. Um, but if, if that's your decision and if that's what you want to do, I serve at your pleasure. And that's what John the Baptist is saying here. I've done my job. I've worked hard. I've pointed to the Savior, I've gotten people ready for him, and if it's time for Jesus to take center stage, I'm okay with that. Because John knows that God is the source of everything, the good and the bad, the troubles and the triumphs, the wins and the losses, he knows that God's in control of everything. And it reminds us that we need to acknowledge that everything we have, big or small, good or bad, comes from God. Whether we have a mom and dad that accept us and love us for who we are, a mom and dad that are always giving us a hard time that we don't really want to be around, or if we have a mom and dad that don't want us to be around them. Maybe we have a job that we're fortunate that it's fulfilling and pays well and works out good, or we have a job that we dread going to. Or we have a group of friends that even though they're not your family, they're more like your family than your family is. Or maybe you don't have any friends and you feel lonely. 
we acknowledge that everything we have, big or small, good or bad, comes from God. So John the Baptist has described for us the groom. He's thanked the groom, and then he points to the groom in verse 28. He says, you yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ. I have been sent ahead of him. And I wonder if John the Baptist is a little upset at this point because these guys aren't getting it. He's been telling them his purpose all along, but they're not remembering what he came to do. In John chapter 1, verse 8, it talks about John the Baptist saying, He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Verse 15 says, John testified about Jesus and cried out saying, This is of he whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than me. John chapter 1, verse 20, And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ, says John the Baptist. Verse 23, John the Baptist said, I am a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Those guys weren't getting it that simply John the Baptist had a job to do to point to the Savior. John has done his job. He did it well. Now he's pointing to the groom. He had done his job. And that tells us that we need to apply ourselves to this specific job God has assigned for us to do whether a formal job or an informal position where we have a role to fill. Maybe when you retire, you find yourself you have more free time and more finances. Your job might be to volunteer and help out in places or provide financial help to organizations that need it. Maybe you have some health issues that come up and you realize that it's going to take everything you have to do what the doctor says in order to get better. Or maybe you have some adult kids and something happens to your adult kids, so you find yourself with a couple of grandkids now you're supposed to raise and take care of. That's your new job that God has assigned to you. And that we need to apply ourselves to that specific job God places for us. Then in verse 29, John the Baptist rejoices for the groom. It says in verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. See, John the Baptist, he tells us he's happy. He, Jesus has arrived. Jesus' crowds grow and John the Baptist's crowds are shrinking but he's still happy about it. And I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of people that would be happy when their competitor down the street grows while their thing they're doing gets smaller. But John the Baptist is happy. And he says here, this joy of mine has been made full. The Baptist scholar A.T. Robertson says the picture here is like a cup that is just filled to the top with joy. It's to the very top. He couldn't be more full of joy than he is for the fact that Jesus has come. And that tells us that we should accept the joy we have when we're doing what God has appointed us to do. Whether we're scrubbing toilets as part of our job as a janitor or searching scripture as part of our role as a Bible study leader. Whether we're helping a rude customer in our retail job or being hospitable on church on Sunday during the potluck. You know, those are all part of our jobs God gives us and we should be joyful when doing those things because our joy doesn't come from our job title or our description. It comes from knowing that we're where God wants us to be and that we're serving him. So we should accept the joy we have when doing what God has appointed us to do. So John the Baptist, he's described that amazing groom. He's thanked the groom. He's pointed to the groom. He's been rejoicing for the groom. Lastly, he steps behind the groom. In verse 30 and 31, he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. See, John the Baptist, he prepares the way and then he gets out of the way for John the Baptist. 
He knew Jesus was better than him, and he was glad to step aside and let Jesus take front, or front stage. And that tells us we should applaud the person that goes on to do greater and better things than us. And that's probably the best way that we can combat jealousy in our lives, when we applaud other people that do greater and better things than us. Sometimes we think a way to battle jealousy is just to be humble, uh, but that doesn't always work. Charles Swindoll, in his commentary on this verse, says, There's a sad misconception among some Christians that genuine humility stems from feelings of worthlessness. They mistakenly think that decreasing self will increase Christ. Frankly, that sounds more like depression than joy. Truth be told, the attention focus is still self. John regarded the exaltation of Christ as the source of his joy. F.B. Meyer writes, the only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. Swindoll continues, don't waste time trying to deceive yourself by looking, uh, looking super humble. That's focusing on the wrong object. You'll dig yourself into a hole trying to act humble, appear humble, and sound humble. Before long, you'll be the proudest one in church. Instead, stand aside, forget yourself as you exalt Christ, turn glory toward him, and without you ever knowing it, humility will have emerged naturally. Like Swindoll says, a Christian thinks about Christ, not himself or herself. The Christian thinks about others, not himself or herself, because that's what Christ did. As believers, we should be the most unselfish people in the world because we follow a man that was the most unselfish person in the world that gave up his life for us. So we should applaud people that go on to do greater and better things than us, just as John the Baptist does here, stepping aside for the Savior. So as we wrap up our time together, I'm going to ask you five questions. Are you a friend of the groom? Do you know the groom as your personal savior that died for your sins on the cross and offered salvation to you? Do you know the groom? Second question, have you acknowledged God as the source of the things current your life? And have you thanked him for those things? Third, are you applying yourself to the job God has set before you? Even though it might be difficult and hard and not the job you want, are you applying yourself to that job? Fourth question, are you experiencing joy through that work you had? And lastly, are you congratulating others that are doing greater and better things than you? Are you encouraging them, even though it's difficult to keep them going and you have what they have? Are you encouraging and congratulating them? These are all gentle reminders from us. These are all gentle reminders for us from John the Baptist that life is not about us. It's about Christ first and then also about others. Let's pray. God, thank you for this reminder from John the Baptist that we are supposed to point to you. Our culture tells us to think about us and look out for ourselves and take care of ourselves. But John the Baptist's character and his testimony here tell us that he was focused on you and trying to point others to you. And it's a reminder for us that we should look to you and follow you and encourage and help others as they try to do that as well. We pray for our church family as they go about their week that they can find ways to not feel jealous, but instead can encourage others and applaud them, focus on the tasks you give them. We pray for those here for safe week and good productive times in their jobs. And we pray for those that aren't here this morning that you would watch over them and protect them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So at this time, I'll invite you to stand if you're able, and I'll read you the benediction. Dismiss us now, O Lord, in your name. 
Send us forth in your strength. Keep us in your care. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.